Colonial Woods Missionary Church presents Keys to Confident Living. Amen. Can you give the Lord a hand as you're seated today? Great to see you. And if you're uh, joining from home, I want to say welcome to you as well. And we're so excited you're with us on this, this week before Christmas as we come together. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to take them and turn to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to eventually get there, probably 15 or 10 minutes or so. And we're going to do our best to, uh, to talk about this, this last, or as I focus on it, this last part of the advent of Christ. Because we've been talking about the advent, His arrival, and we've been focusing quite a lot on the coming of Christ into this world, but uh, the, always as a part of the church has been the focus on the promise of Christ that He's coming again, and that's where we're going to be focusing today just a little bit. This last week, uh, people every once in a while will slip little envelopes underneath my, my office door. Normally, they're, they're positive, not always, but mostly they are. And as I opened it up, I don't know if it was positive or not, but it was a newspaper article and it was a picture of me. I thought I recognized it because I remember the event. It happened back in May and it's when we had the National Day of Prayer. In fact, yeah, there it is. It's not my favorite picture because it kind of highlights this bald spot that's in the back. By the way, when I first moved here, I remember watching the television program one night and go, hey, who's that bald guy in the front, uh, in the front of the church? Realized it was me sitting down there. There's something about the light. But anyway, so we, and it was, if you were there, it was a lot of fun. This was National Day of Prayer. This was back in uh, May. We had, I don't know, probably 100, 150 cars. Uh, we got together, put it out over a radio broadcast, uh, working with our local uh, Christian radio station, and we just had a great time as we, um, as we prayed together. We honked. We celebrated. It was really great. Now, here's the deal. When I got this thing, I thought it was the old article. I thought, oh, that's kind of neat. They gave me an article from five, six months ago. It wasn't. It was December the 11th. That picture was in the paper. Here was the headline. <laughs> Drive-in bingo. You don't find that funny? I find that hilarious. Drive in bingo, Pastor Phil. I thought that was kind of funny. Anyway, so I, I looked at this thing. I'm like, wait a minute here. By the way, I'm glad that's all it said. It could have said a lot of things. I'm going, wait a minute. That's not what that picture is from. That picture was from prayer. That picture was for us like six months ago, and it's being used with the headline, new bingo. And I'll be honest with you, I contacted my board and said, hey, I figured out my retirement gig. I figured out what I'm going to do. In fact, I'm thinking that might be a, a way to go. And when I looked at it, the first thing I thought is, wait a minute, not as advertised. That is not what we were advertising, right? And when you think of the first Christmas, you think of Christ coming into the world, you think of Jesus Christ coming, it was not as advertised. That is not the way the Messiah was supposed to come into the world. That was not the way the anticipated Christ was, he was going to be a ruler, he was going to be a king. He was going to have authority. He was going to have opulence. He would have wealth. He was going to be an incredible political leader. Everybody was expecting one thing. They got something very different in the coming of Christ in His advent. Now, as I have been hinting to you this entire series, yes, we celebrate the coming of Christ Advent season. But there is actually a second advent. It has been focused on since the early church. When Jesus ascended before the disciples in Acts chapter 1, the angel said, what are you doing looking up into the sky? This same Jesus is going to return in the same fashion one day as He returns for believers. And he'll be with, you'll be with Him forever. And so there is coming a day of the return of Christ and His first coming and His second coming, the first advent, the second advent, are going to be very different. When He came in His first advent, Luke chapter 2 says He was just a little baby. Matthew chapter 1 through 3, they, He illustrates the same thing. He's just a little baby. He's a humble, lowly baby. Lowly doesn't mean that babies are low. It just means they're, they're humble. I mean, they're weak. They're, they're not strong. They need to be cared for. I mean, uh, baby Jesus was absolutely dependent upon Mary and Joseph and all who would give him care, and that just was a very humble beginning. He was laid in a manger. He was in, we think, a stall. Now, if you translate that word, it says there was no room for them in the inn. 
we don't know if it was an inn or if it was a house, which that same word in the Hebrew, and, and then the front part of the house, and so they had to put them back where the animals were at. We're not exactly sure how that whole thing came about, but we know this, it was very meager beginning. He lived essentially as a refugee for a little while in Egypt as King Herod wanted to kill him. And so they had to leave their home, their family, everything as they kind of, as they moved to a new area and kind of had to survive. It was very meager. But Scripture says in His coming again, Revelation chapter 19, it says that He is going to come authoritatively. He's not as a baby, but as a ruling king. In fact, he's going to be a glorious king. He's going to come with an army of heaven. He's going to come with a great multitude. He's going to come with the description is incredible. I assume it's somewhat symbolic as it talks about flames and fire and all this. But it's to indicate his power and his glory. And written on his thigh will be the words, King of kings, Lord of lords. That is is a different coming. And there'll be no question of His glory, of His authority, of His power. In His first coming, we see in Luke chapter 2, that it was announced by an angel. Now it says it's an angel of the Lord. We don't know if it's the angel of the Lord as described in the Old Testament. Don't think so. But it's an angel of the Lord could be the high angel. We don't know that for sure. He was then joined by a multitude of the heavenly host, singing glory to God in the highest. But the word angel is the word angelos. It just simply means the messenger. In fact, Billy Graham wrote a, uh, a book a number of years ago. It was probably 30, 40 years ago. I keep it on my shelf. I, I didn't get it when it first came out. That wasn't me. I, I got it later, but it's just on angels. In fact, I think the title is Angels or Angels, 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 or something like that. But anyway, he starts talking about biblically just the different kinds of angels. And you have serving angels, and you have ministering angels around the throne, and cherubim and seraphim. It's kind of an interesting study. But it's interesting. Angels, they minister to believers, and they, and they obviously carry out the Lord's orders and authority. They can even, angels can even come to the rescue of believers. We see that in Scripture. But it's interesting, the primary role is to be the messengers of God. In His second coming, it is going to be with a trumpet call, and it will be the archangel, the highest angel. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says that with a loud command and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. I've always thought, and this is kind of the sick humor of a pastor, um, is I always thought it'd be kind of neat to do a message on the return of the Lord and talk about the trumpet call of God and come to the altar time where we just, you know, response and then have somebody out in the hallway, you know, playing a trumpet. I just thought it'd be kind of cool. See how many people fled to the altar and just want to make sure everything's okay, you know. And, Anyway, that's, that's what we do for fun as pastors, but I guess you guys do other things. But anyway, and so this, this, but this is going to be an incredible announcement. This is going to be authoritative, and we're going to see Christ coming in His glory. In His first advent, we see in the original first Christmas, it was witnessed by mom and dad, Mary and Joseph, witnessed by shepherds, that they were the witnesses to this King of Kings. God chose the lowliest, the lowliest of society to kind of bear testimony and witness to Jesus Christ. I guess you could say the angels, or the, or the angels, the angels kind of bear testimony, but certainly the animals that were there. In fact, um, in the uh, song Away in the Manger, right, it starts talking about the cattle are lowing, uh, the, poor baby, uh, the poor baby wakes or sleeps or something like that. And, and it's interesting that we see that, man, this is a very meager witness to the King of kings and the Lord of lords coming into the world. But in His second coming, it tells us in Revelation chapter 19 that He is going to be accompanied by a great multitude of heaven. The multitude likely represents not only the saints who have already gone before that return with Him are part of His heavenly army. It says the army of heaven, which I assume includes angelic hosts. Scripture also indicates that there's going to be a breaking open of the eastern sky as Christ returns. And this is going to be a, a glorious return. He will be known as the armies of heaven return. 
You overthrow Satan. Now again, you're saying, well, how does that all happen? What does that all look like? Come to my class when we teach that and we can talk a little bit more about it, but it's an incredible imagery. The last thing that I notice is that in Jesus' first coming is that he came for the purpose to serve and to die. In fact, he says that, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, he says, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to die as a ransom for many. That, that's the purpose of why Jesus came. In his coming again, it is not to, it's not to serve, and it is not to be silent, and it is not to be gentle and meek. He is going to reign, rule, and judge. In fact, it's so interesting what it says. In fact, Revelation chapter 19, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Malachi chapter 4, chapter 2 talks about his coming and almost with a breath overcoming the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. We see that he comes with incredible authority. And the Word of God says a number of times, beginning in the Psalms, that he will reign with an iron scepter. It is a picture of his power, and it is a, it's an ongoing picture of his presence permanency in that role not coming to serve he is coming to reign now when we talk about the return of christ normally we break it into two parts there's the return of christ for the believer to rescue the believer that's the primary intent we use the word rapture to describe that because scripture says we will be caught up first thessalonians chapter uh, four And so there's a catching up of the believer. It's really about rescue. But then there's the coming of Christ to return to reign. That's really what we're referring to in Revelation chapter 19. And he will reign for all of eternity. In fact, what does it say uh, in the hallelujah chorus? And he shall reign forever and ever. That's a whole thing is describing the glorious king that is yet to come. And when we talk about this stuff, so many believers that I talk to, they often will contact me. They are petrified. This whole topic scares them. In fact, some of you right now are going, this is the worst Christmas uh, message ever. I've had a really hard year, Pastor. You talked about darkness, and you talked about this, and you talked about, and last week you talked about Jesus coming to our heart, and I was feeling pretty good. Now I come in here, and now you're talking about the coming of Christ. Man, that's a bummer. It scares me. It isn't supposed to. For the believer in Jesus Christ, this conversation is supposed to be glorious, hope-filled, encouraging. Because the coming of Christ is good news for the believer. This, this was at the very centrality, not just the forgiveness of sins, but Christ's coming to redeem and to rescue. What does it say in Scripture? Paul says, and so we will be with the Lord forever. That's good news. That's not bad news. We will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, this is supposed to be encouraging. This is what you use to encourage. Because what he's saying is, is, this isn't all there is. And if you're going through a hard time, hold on. Because God's coming. He's coming to this darkness. He's coming to this hardship. He is coming again. He is going to reign. The, the, the stuff that's wicked in the world, it's not always going to be happening. It's good news. A number of times in the New Testament, it tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, and the Holy Spirit, that if you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, He is the deposit guaranteeing what is to come. You have the third person of the Trinity, God Himself dwells within you, enabling you, God with you, and you need to understand that he is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Well, what is to come? Christ's return to rescue the church. And this is not some little five-cent nickel or a dime that really, frankly, if you lose it, it's not the end of the world. This is God himself guaranteeing that God himself will show up. I love it. My favorite one, Malachi chapter 4, and there's lots of them, but Malachi chapter 4, as he talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord, he says, but for those of you, verse 2, who revere my name, okay, those are those who are believers, he says, for those of you who revere my name, 
the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and you will leap like the calves released from the stalls. And if you didn't grow up on a farm, that probably doesn't mean a lot. But it's an incredible imagery from a kid who grew up on a farm. Because in the wintertime, and we didn't have that many calves around the house. I mean, we, we, we didn't have thousands of calves or even hundreds. We had like 12, maybe 12, 13, 14 steers that were around the house. And, or not the house, but it was around the, <laughs> the barn a little bit. Mom was constantly cleaning, you know, that kind of a thing. So they were, we had about 12, 13 calves that we would keep. And then we had like, you know, 10 to 15 pigs. And then we'd have 100 chickens and, you know, that kind of thing. It was a small farm. And so dad didn't want the calves, you know, rutting everything up when it was wet in the wintertime. So we kind of corralled all the calves into the main barnyard area so that they couldn't go back and, and trample up, ruin the hay and that kind of stuff. And so we, the smaller calves, we sectioned off into a different part of the barn and we just kind of bent the fence around and created its own little pen. And they weren't allowed to really go outside much. But then in the spring, when it started to kind of thaw a little bit and the grass started to pop through, dad would go over to the eastern side of the, of the barn. He would unlatch those latches. He would pull that, barn aside, that, that door over and the little calves, we would push them out into the field. And when those little calves hit the sunlight in the spring and they were able to run around, they literally start hopping. They... they <laughs> I think I can't do it as well. But they're just like, whoo, whoo, whoo. I mean, they would do that kind of thing. And then they would leap and they would kick their legs. It was the funniest time. The first time I ever saw it, I'm like, what in the world did dad put in their water? I mean, it was incredible. And that's the imagery. Why? Because he says, when the day of the Lord comes, believer, freedom. You are going to experience this is incredible. And so you don't have to be afraid of this. But you should be challenged by it. John, in 1 John chapter 2, is speaking to the, the church. He's speaking to believers. And he says, um, the Antichrist, or the spirit of the Antichrist, is already working in the world. We know that we're coming. Things are wrapping up. And so here's what he says in verse 28. And now, dear children, by the way, I know what he means by that. Because John is very specific. Now, this is the same John who wrote the Gospel of John. And he is the same John who wrote John 1.12, which says, To all who receive him, to all who believe in his name, he gives them the right to be called what? Children of God. So when he's writing, he's writing to believers, those who have received Christ, those who have believed in his name. And he says, Now, dear children... He says, um, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know what, that he is righteous, then you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Again, that's John. Because John also was the author who put down what Jesus said about salvation to Nicodemus. You must be born again. So when he talks about being born of him, he says one of the evidences of you being born again is to do what is right. It's a neat passage. Then he says this. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. See, the reason the world doesn't know him or us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. Are you starting to get a theme here? We are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears at his coming... We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's a powerful thought. John says, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to be like, but I know what he's going to be like because 
He's already resurrected. He already has a body that is touchable and visible. He's able to eat, praise God. The resurrection body can still eat, and yet he is not bound by the laws of physics as we know it. He's able to appear before the disciples. And when we're before him, we're going to see him, and we're going to be just like him. That's talking about the resurrected, glorious body that awaits. I'm hoping three inches taller, a little bit narrower, but I won't care because my knees won't hurt, right? Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies Himself just as He is pure. And John causes me to evaluate three Areas of my life when I think of the return of the Lord. Number one, I evaluate my relationship with Him. Do I know Him? Not do I know about Him. Not can I carry on a conversation. Not did I go to church. Not were my parents Christian. Not, not uh, uh, being able to have a good dissertation and conversation about who Christ is. Do you know Him? Have I, like a small child, trusted in Him as He talks about that I've got to become like a little child to enter eternal life as we talked about last week? Have I confessed my sins? Have I acknowledged Christ as my Savior? Have I, have I, have I received and believed in Him? And so when He says, continue in Him, when He says, that we know everyone who does what is right is born of Him. By the way, why does he say that? Because John's consistent theme in 1 John is that it is inconsistent to say that you are born of Him, that you have a relationship with Him, that you are walking in the light when you are walking in darkness. He says those who harbor sin and it has become a part of the habit of their heart, he just simply says it's inconsistent. So the question is, do I have a relationship with Him? And by the way, if I'm evaluating my relationship with Him, His coming also causes me to evaluate my relationship with others. Is there some relationship that I, you know what, I'm someday going to stand before Him. Either at my going to Him or Him coming to me. And so I won't always have an opportunity to make sure my relationships are where they need to be. And so I need to make sure my relationships are where they need to be. The second evaluation is my walk. Am I in fellowship with Him? And it is different than relationship. Because you, you can be married to someone and not be in fellowship with them. Right? I met a guy a number of years ago, after two, three years of knowing him as a parishioner, told me he was married. I said, you're kidding. I didn't know that. I haven't met her yet. He goes, well, I don't live with her. We haven't lived together for years. They're married. Those of you who have family or those of you, you can, you can be a parent not be in fellowship. You can, have, you can be a child and not have fellowship. You can, you can know someone from your childhood who's a lifetime friend and still not have spoken to them in 20 years. There's no fellowship. By the way, in chapter 1 he says, so if we're going to talk about having fellowship and yet still walking in darkness, that's inconsistent. Now, now obviously fellowship means that... Um, I mean, I think being in the Word of God is really important to fellowship, right? What does God have to say? What is the Spirit of God saying to me? So listening to Him, certainly prayer, where I'm not only speaking, but listening to God. Uh, worship is part of our fellowship with God. We celebrate who He is, and we celebrate as a body of Christ. But again, we come right back to that same thing that He talks about when He says, hey, I want to make sure that when I stand before Him, I'm un I'm, I can be... Uh, unashamed because I'm, I'm where I need to be in my walk with him. And so he says, everyone who has this hope purifies himself. When he says purifies himself, it's not washing your hands in a certain way or going through a religious ceremony. 
it means that those things that are in my life that are inconsistent with someone who says they're in fellowship with God, I confess them and I'm willing to put them aside. And by the way, the things that ought to be in my life that are not in my life, I embrace and I begin again. And then the third thing that I evaluate is my readiness, which simply means, am I prepared? It doesn't mean that I necessarily want to go tomorrow. It doesn't mean I think it's okay for you to want to live. We're made to live. People think somehow that's wrong. No, 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 no. We were created to live and create for all of eternity. And so, so understand that living is okay. It's okay for you to want to live. The, the contrary is actually kind of anti how God made us. But am I ready? Because I don't know when I'm going to stand before him, whether it's my going to him or him coming to me. I don't know. I was reminded when I was writing this of a story I heard years and years ago of a young pastor who was going to a church. It was the first time he was at this church, and he hadn't even preached yet. And so he got into his office. He was going to be speaking that next Sunday. Thought, hey, I'm going to go visit some of the parishioners. And he noticed there was a lady in the church that needed a visit. It was just a little note made there. And so he thought, I'll go over there. And so he went over, and it was an older lady in the church. And he got there. There was a car on the driveway. He assumed you were there. So he knocked on the door. She wouldn't, nobody opened the door. He said, man, I think she's here. And so he knocked louder. He knocked and knocked really loud. Nobody came to the door. Knocked like a third, nobody came. He said, well, she must be gone. So he thought he'd have a little fun. And he had a sense of humor. Took out his card, and on the back of the card he wrote this. Uh, Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opened the door... I will come in and eat with them and they with me. Signed, Pastor so-and-so. Hope to see you Sunday. Put it on the door. Next Sunday, he preaches his first message, stands out by the door, he's saying hi to people. A lady came up to him, very sheepishly, never even really made eye contact. Handed him a little card, walked away. So he just looked at the card real quick, and all it said was the sister's name, and it just said Genesis 3.10. He didn't remember it. So after everybody left, he went back, got his Bible, looked it in. Genesis 3.10. I heard you in the garden, but I was naked, so I hid. <laughs> First hour erupted on that one. And I don't know if you've ever been in a compromising situation, even embarrassing. It doesn't have to be this. You're all messy and just all nasty from working and you, somebody comes to your house. You, you're a mess. Notice what he says in verse 28 and 29. Dear children, I want you to be confident and unashamed at his coming. Being ready is not being fearful that I may or may not make it. Relationship deals with that. But someday I'm going to stand before him and I really don't want to be ashamed about things. I want to live in such a way so that when I stand before him, I'm not going to be arrogant. I'm not going to be all that. But I can know I am where I need to be. And it is always appropriate to ask that question. I like the trilogy uh, by J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, The Lord of the Rings. Some of you may have seen the movies. It came out a few years ago. By the way, incredible analogy, or I don't know if he'd call it an analogy or not, or allegory. I don't know what he calls it, but there's all kinds of like good versus evil, and you see some Christ figures, and you see... You see some satanic figures, you see some angelic figures, you see human humanity figures, it, you have heroes and losers and you have all kinds of things. But it's interesting, in the first one you learn all the characters, it's called the Fellowship of the Ring, 
and you see Frodo, who's kind of the main heroic character, and his uncle Bilbo Baggins, and, uh, and uh, you have Gimli, who's the dwarf, and, and you have uh, uh, Sam, right? He's the best friend, and Merry and Pippin, who are the kind of comedic relief, and it's just a neat, I, I really enjoy the Fellowship of the Ring. It's kind of like these, kind of these new friends. There's Aragon. Aragon is the king who's been kind of missing in action, but he's the king of Gondor, which is like the the city on the hill. I mean, it's an incredible city. It's the biggest city of humanity. Movie number two is called The Two Towers, and I got to tell you, it's one of the darkest, depressing movies I've ever watched. I remember getting done with that movie. It was around Christmas time whenever it came out, and I sat there going, man, that was a loser. Because you get to the end of the thing, I mean, all it is, all it is, is misery, struggle, misery, struggle, battles and struggle. And at the very end, there's nobody wins. Unless you know the third movie. The third movie is called The Return of the King. And it is the picture of the heavenly forces battling against the satanic forces, overwhelming them, and the king, Aragon, the rightful ruler of Gondor, elevated to where he's supposed to be, not just the king, he is the king of kings because he is the ruler of rulers, and there is peace in the land. And listen, you can play with that all day, but what an incredible picture you can survive all kinds of hard stuff when you realize the return of the king is ahead of you. That's the advent. That's the coming advent. That's the promise of heaven, believer. That is the coming second advent of Christ. It is not to be discouraging. It is to be foundationally hope-filled of what is yet to come. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for um, the clarity of your word. There are, there are many things we have questions about, but, Lord, so much we know that you are coming again. And, Lord, you promise. What, what was it that Jesus said? Why did he say it? John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me, for in my Father's house are many rooms. And I go there to prepare a place for you. He hasn't forgotten you. Yes, it's been 2,000 plus years. He hasn't forgotten you. He's just getting ready for you. I go to prepare a place for you. And oh, by the way, if I go to prepare a place for you, he says, I will come back and take you to be with me where I am also. And so Lord, this Christmas we cling to you for some in a very dark season, we cling to the hope of the King of kings and Lord of lords, yet coming through the eastern sky and pushing back darkness because we know you are in control. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Colonial Woods Missionary Church presents Keys to Confident Living.